Welcome to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. This episode is going to be about pig CAFOs, health in the environment. What in the world is a CAFO? Okay, after this segment, you're going to know more about it, and then we're going to come back into the studio for discussion. Zapytujemy, kiedy pan minister opracuje normy zanieczyszczeń dla środowiska odnośnie zanieczyszczeń kazami. Można wyciągnąć się w Could you please tell us what, what are your concerns? Pierwszy problem to jest koncentracja przemysłu szkodliwego dla środowiska. A więc fermy, przemysłowe fermy tuczu. Zakłady utylizacyjne. Ja chcę czyste powietrze, żeby nie śmierdziało, żeby moja wnusia żyła w, czystości, w czystym powietrzu, zdrowo, tak? Żeby mogła żyć naprawdę zgodnie z przyrodą. I'm Tracy Worcester and I've lived in the countryside most of my life. But whether it's in Britain or abroad, I've seen small family farms going bankrupt because of the arrival of giant factory farms. For years, I've campaigned against the destruction of rural livelihoods and to improve animal welfare. So these pigs have been foraging, getting rid of the bracken in a National Trust wood. This film is the story of my four-year exploration into the global pig business. A journey which goes from the UK to the USA, South America and Poland. To find out where and how pork is produced, who wins and who loses. But you'll be lucky to find any of this information on the label. Hey, look. Thick pork sausages. But you can look everywhere on the packet. There is no indication where it comes from. Though you can buy high welfare pork in some UK supermarkets, if you want to pay less for your high welfare pork while paying your farmer a fair price and keeping your money in the local economy, it's best to go to your local farmer's market. They know the quality of the product because we have a direct relationship with our customers. If they don't like what we sell them, they'll come back next week and tell us. For stall holder Mike King, the secret of producing top quality pork lies in the humane treatment of his animals. I think pigs, are, they're such intelligent, sort of inquisitive animals. They need to be active all day long, searching for roots and grubs and things like that. Whereas pigs in concrete boxes, um, they've got nothing to do all day long. They're totally bored. It's one of the reasons why I left that more intense farming and, and decided to keep them like this. The intensive farming Mike referred to was pioneered in America and it's the way most supermarket pork is produced. Early in my inquiry, I met up with veteran animal welfare campaigner Tom Garrett, who's opposed intensive livestock production ever since it began. What we have, I think, is the application of industrial systems that were designed to build cars and build machines to living creatures. It's infinitely cruel in my mind, and no civilized society, whatever civilized society means, ought to countenance it. Sows, for example, are subjected to confinement in a very narrow cage, so narrow they can't even turn around during, during gestation. Workers in these installations have ceased to regard the animals even as alive, I think. They become habituated to cruelty and eventually they become genuinely brutalized. I believe such cruelty happens when pigs are seen not as animals, but as an industrial raw material. 
But the more I've looked into industrial farming, the more I've come to believe that it's bad for our food, our health, and the livelihoods of rural communities. America's industrial pig farmers copied the chicken industry by cramming thousands of animals into a confined space. There are sometimes as many as 10,000 pigs in buildings like this, their waste dropping through a slatted floor. One of the workers I met told me what it was like working there. Y, y trabaja uno um, 12 días y descansa dos. Pues lo que me ha afectado son los ojos y, y luego pues a veces quiere dar gómito. Eso es todo lo que lo que a mí me ha. Over the years, scientists have studied the effect of working in these installations and have found again and again that they can damage workers' health. One man who studied the scientific literature is Dr. David Wallinger. The risks that have been most studied are definitely the risk to people working inside the facility. And there is an extensive amount of science that really goes into some detail about how a pretty large percentage of the people working in these facilities, whether it's hogs or chickens, will come down with chronic sinus infections, asthma, um, bronchitis, uh, and other respiratory diseases um, that are related to this mixture that they're breathing in. The problems with pig waste are not confined to those working in the farms. I met Rick Dove, former lawyer and army colonel turned fisherman, who campaigns for clean water in North Carolina, where there are hundreds of factory pig farms. It's the way they get rid of their waste that's really most problematic. The, the hogs uh, dump their feces and urine on the floor. It goes under the ha hog house out to a lagoon. I and mean, there are no beautiful women in bathing suits by any of these lagoons. But it goes out to the lagoon and then they slop it on the fields. And then it runs off into these drain pipes they have underneath the fields. It runs off into the ditches and it goes right down to our streams, creeks, and rivers. And it's full of nitrogen. It's basically untreated waste. There are 10 million hogs in this small area. And those 10 million hogs are producing more fecal waste each and every day than 100 million people. The first thing to realize uh, when you're talking about the gases that come out of a big confined swine operation is that it's really a toxic brew, that there's so many volatile gases mixed in with dust, bacteria, and antibiotics, and they're all mixed together in a very, very complex mixture of some three or even 400 different substances. So that's what one is exposing a neighbor or a family or a child to. During my research, I visited people who live near giant pig farms. They came out and tested my water, and in a couple of days, I got a letter telling me not to drink my water, don't bath in my water, don't cook with it. There's flies on the side of the house, all around the doors, all around the windows. Great big, greasy-looking flies. I have been to the allergy clinic for my allergies from this, trying to breathe. And it, it, it makes my eyes run, it makes my eyes puffy, it makes my nose run, it makes my throat sore. When it's spraying, you just cut your breath off and you get like phlegm in your throat, you, your eyes start running, you know, and you just get a headache, you know, and you just really almost, I guess, just get angry because you can't breathe. In 2003, when the US government introduced new controls on spraying pig waste, it was estimated that 80% of the farms in the USA at the time were in breach of the new regulations. And in 2004, a scientific study found that many older lagoons in North Carolina were leaking waste and contaminating the water table. Stop the Throughout the 1990s, small farmers in America campaigned against the growth of big farms. Food has become a major profit-generating commodity and has spread onto a global playing field where food producers Workers and consumers are reduced to pawns, manipulated by giant corporations. During the 1990s, large-scale meat processors bought up livestock farms. This vertical integration allowed the corporations to control the whole process from farming and slaughtering to packaging. 
The factory farms were now the main buyers of pigs. And as the price paid for pigs fell, many small farmers went bust. One survivor was Paul Sobochinsky. They wanted to control the market, and they wanted to control about how livestock production was going to be raised, and they wanted to take more of the profits from production of agriculture, take the profits the farmers made as independent producers and put them in their pocket. My tipping point, I think, was when I saw hogs go down to $8 a hundredweight in this country, um, worse than the Depression in the 1930s. And I saw that, that pain, I saw that happen to farmers, that I knew that we had to fight back, that we had to stand up, or they were just going to roll over and take democracy, our freedom. Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. This episode is called Pig CAFOs, uh, Health in the Environment. With me, I have a guest who knows a lot about this topic. I have Darwin Bentlich. Darwin, thanks for uh, joining us on Green Time. No problem, Don. And, and, and Darwin, um, you are with Missouri Rural Crisis Center, is that correct? Yes. And what, you mentioned a couple of other organizations that you're also with. What, what are those? I'm with the uh, Missouri Coalition for the Environment, and I also am, am a member of the Missouri Farmers Union. Missouri Farmers Union. Now, now tell me, um, have you, how do you, what is a CAFO? C A F O. What does that mean? It's a concentrated animal feeding operation. Is the definition of it. And and are those something that is good for Missouri's economy and good for the health and produce good quality uh, pork and beef? Well, as the more information comes about, it's it's not very good for especially the rural communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever you go to the supermarket and everything, the quality of products may be a little questionable. Uh, the environment while their intentions mm. were not to destroy the environment, but uh, as more and more information comes out that they are doing a lot of damage to the environment. Well, l let me ask you this. The DVD that we just saw uh, uh, about pig, called Pig Business, yes. were, there any, uh, were there any issues that that uh, brought up to your mind that you, you wanted to th uh, uh, respond to? Well, part of this uh, in the DVD had people you know, beating the animals and everything, mm. which, you know, being a farmer, I realize that sometimes you got to be a little bit forceful, but that seems to be a little extreme. But the worst part about it is hogs are some of the smartest animals right. on the earth. Mm. And the fact that they cage them up their entire life and then spent on a concrete floor, that's probably more cruel than the the beating and everything else. Well, that, 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 that's certainly true with humans. I mean, for human just to be isolated or alone in a cell yeah, it's for, for year after year <laughs> is, 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 you know, as much torture as, as being uh, beaten with a stick. Yeah, it's punishment. It's called jail, you know. Right. <laughs> and, and so, it's, it's, so where do you get your information from, um, uh, uh, information about uh, concentrated animal feeding operations from reading, from the newspaper? How, how do you know about them? Uh, all of the above, you might say, from reading newspapers and uh, ex first-hand experience. You know, well, what's what's your first-hand experience? We, ha I'm a farmer first, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a family farm. It's been in, in the farm for three generations, and uh, started in about 15 years ago. They moved one in that joined us on the north side. Uh, and and wh where is where are you located in, in Missouri? Yes, up uh, in the Lamar, Missouri area. And is that, that's near Springfield and Joplin? That's uh, kind of in between Springfield and Joplin. Joplin's okay. south and Springfield's east. And what, what happened when the CAFO moved in? Well, the first one, nobody really knew about them. You know, that was in 95, I believe. Mm. And uh, the man that moved it in, he was a friendly guy, you know, and everything. And he actually asked the neighbors mm. if he could put that up. Mm. And at that time, we had no idea what they were about. We farmed mm. the farm directly across from him. And uh, pretty soon we found out when we broke down, we went a mile mm. to the north to work on anything because it, it got a little bit smelly around there. So it really got smelly having uh, how many, what, 50,000 hogs, 100,000? No, these are smaller ones. Smaller ones, okay. Um, to kind of get around the rules and regulations, mm. you know, but the problems with them, in our area, as they started dotting the countryside with them. In, in other words, if, if, if there had been some that were that small, they wouldn't have been so bad, but they were all over the place. Yeah, uh, 
if you're in the wrong place, small or large, you know, the small ones, the lagoons hold two to three million gallons of, of waste, you know. Of, and, and, and so that, that is really hard on you in terms of breathing that and smelling that every day. Yes, well, you don't, sometimes you're lucky the wind blows but, the but, other way. Well, but, Darwin, let, we're going to take a break. And then we're, uh, we're going to see a little bit more from the DVD, and then we're going to come back to discussing the issue with Darwin Ben Lynch. The arrival of corporate power in agriculture in the UK has pushed farmers off the land and onto the streets. In 2008, pig farmers from across the country besieged Downing Street. We already know in this country we've lost 40% of the herd in the last 10 years. And I think if this continues and we don't get support, particularly from the supermarkets, then we're going to see another drop of, of equal proportions, maybe more. As our production's gone down, imports have gone up. And we know from all the work that we've done that 70% of those imports would be illegal to produce in the UK on the grounds of animal welfare. In most EU countries, it's legal to keep pregnant sows permanently in stores like these, although they've been banned in the UK. How can they possibly sanction pork to come into this country reared on lesser welfare standards than they force us to do? How can that be right? At the Oxford Farming Conference, I spoke to David Cameron, who, when in opposition, seemed to think it was possible to protect our farmers. Yes, we should be an open, global, free-trading economy. That's what Britain has always been. But it should be on the basis of rules. And I made the particular point about animal welfare that just as we don't accept uh, cars that uh, aren't meeting our emission standards, so we shouldn't accept food that doesn't meet um, welfare standards. However, there's no sign of any restrictions on lower welfare imports from his government. It's particularly important to buy high welfare pork because of the emergence of antibiotic resistant bacteria, as explained by farmer Richard Young. One of the big weaknesses of the system is their heavy dependence on antibiotics and the fact that that causes infections which can spread from animals to humans, such as Salmonella, E. coli, um, Campylobacter, and even MRSA. And in the Netherlands, for example, where the most research has been undertaken, 40% of their pigs are carrying a strain of MRSA that can pass to humans. It's been spread rapidly on the pig farms because the antibiotics that are being put in the pig feed are actually selecting for it. That means they kill off the other bacteria which might provide some natural competition, but they don't kill off the MRSA because the MRSA is resistant. Meat which may appear very cheap is in fact very, very expensive and in some cases that could be at the cost of our own lives. We haven't had a new type of antibiotic, a new class of antibiotics for more than a decade now and it's very difficult to see that um, we're going to find new antibiotics that would have the same effect as ones that we've, we've had in the past such as penicillin um, which has saved millions of lives down the years. Um, there just isn't that level of research into finding new agents. So I think we have to be more careful with the ones that we have now and how we're, um, how we're forcing the evolution of these uh, strains such as these MRSA strains to become increasingly resistant to the antibiotics that we have because there won't be anything left in the cupboard in uh, a few decades down the line. Um, which may um, really point to a, a less intensified um, system of farming where body mass um, increases are, are not the, the prime driver, it's not all economics, and we are having a, a long view in terms of human health. In the USA, the home of the factory farm, several surveys reported that the pig strain of MRSA was found in 70% of pigs and 45% of pig farmers, the highest figure in the world. Small-scale traditional farmers, who seldom need antibiotics, are struggling to survive in a market distorted by the meat industry lobby. Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz, and with me is Darwin Bentledge with the Missouri Rural Crisis Center. And we, we've been talking about concentrated animal feeding operations in Missouri. Now, Darwin, you were just talking about what the effects are of having some of these huge lagoons of animal waste. How large can they be? They can go all the way up to 30 million gallons. 
you know, they, that went out. And uh, the ones around it, ours are smaller, but they're two, three million gallons, which is two or three million gallons. Uh, significant. The uh, the sow operation has a, a lagoon, I believe, ten to fifteen million gallons, and all these started coming in. They went into expansion mode. This was a uh, corporation mm -hmm. from Iowa. Okay. Went into expansion mode, and uh, they were going to make Barton County the hog capital of Missouri was their intent. Oh, my intent. gosh. Well, so, so is Barton County where Springfield or, or Joplin is? No, it's, that's it's, where Lamar. It, it, it's, it's Lamar because it's, it's, uh, the county is between Springfield and Joplin. Yes. Okay. It, and uh, when they started moving them in, why the first thing they did was move them in Golden City. They had a sow operation. Then another sow operation, Kenoma, which is kind of famous for uh, the fight the Richland Township put up against Kenoma. Then they actually put one in just behind our house. Oh my gosh, and so you're, it's right next to you. Well, it's not right, it's half mile away, but it sets within 100 feet of our property line in fields that I have to work. Oh, okay, so, you, you, so you get the smell when you're working. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, and you know where they moved in there, Richland Township voted them out. They built anyhow. They stated they didn't care if the vote was 81% to keep the CAFO out. But but the CAFO was able to come in anyway? Yes, because you cannot zone agricultural structures, even though the Richland Township was not a structure of zoning. It was a density zoning. So these are not coming in because people are demanding them and wanting them in and saying we got good jobs from having them in. No, definitely not. The one behind us, we actually went to the manager since we had the, the original one. We knew what the effects of it was. Mm -hmm. And so we actually went to the manager and asked him not to build next to us. We thought we had enough in our area. Mm -hmm. And his statement was to me, if you don't, or my wife, if you don't like it, protest it. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what we did. You well, know. well, tell me, what are some of the uh, effects uh, of m uh, having CAFOs on the food supply. Duh. I think the, the DVD mentioned things about uh, salmonella outbreaks. Do, are, are, is that accurate? Does that actually affect the food supply? Yeah, and, uh, MRSA can enter the food supply through it. Uh, the dangerous thing about the MRSA coming out of the hog barns, I think in the... M MRSA, that's MRSA, is that right? Yes, that's an antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, okay. And uh, in the DVD, mm. they since this was in Europe, they uh, had a study that, you know, 50% of the farmers that worked in these type operations had MRSA. Uh, well, so the, so the, the antibiotic will not affect them anymore, is that correct? Is that This strain, and what's, what's dangerous about that certain strain coming out of the hog barns is they use many of the same antibiotics that are used on humans. Tetracycline oh, is the main one in hog barns, which is uh, directly related to oxymelin and amoxicillin. And so when that means that we're, if you're getting all of the, that antibiotics around you, then you're going to be less resistant. So if you have a disease and you need amoxicillin or something like that, that's not going to be very effective with you. No, it's not going to work at all. Well, wh why do they use that? Why do they use the antibiotics? They use the antibiotics as a suppression, not as therapeutic. Mm -hmm. They just use it to keep down the diseases, mm -hmm. which, uh, in a suppression type setting, why certain animals will still get sick and usually die. So, so they do it sort of preventively, but then they use massive amounts. Pre yes, uh, animal industry uses more. Darwin, I'm getting the wrap up sign. So I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us at Green Time. And I want to uh, thank everybody at home for tuning into Green Time. Be sure to look at the next episode on this station.